بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين This is Ali Atai, lecturer of comparative theologies at Zaytuna College. We have reached in our Ramadan series entitled The Courageous Five, the great iconoclastic prophets. We have reached our master Isa alayhi salam, the prophet Jesus Christ peace be upon him. Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam, Jesus the son of Mary peace be upon both of them. Jesus peace be upon him is unique amongst these five in the sense that he was actually deified by many of his followers. And today, uh, the belief that Isa alayhi salam is God, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is far and away the dominant theology amongst the Christian community. The verse that I'm going to use to set the stage, as it were, for this session is at the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 116, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ إِذْ, first of all, the particle إِذْ, according to Imam Al-Tantawi, is a particle of futurity, ظَرْفٌ لِزَّمَانِ الْمُسْتَقْبَلِ However, the, ver- the verb that comes directly after إِذْ قَالَ, قَالَ is past tense, it's perfect tense. However, the meaning is future. So this is called a prophetic past tense. And this happens from time to time in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, for example, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ And usually this is translated, the believers will prevail or will win. But here the verb is past perfect. Or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, إِنَّا أَعْطَيْنَكَ الْكَوْثَرِ أَعْطَى is past tense, but usually translated, we will give you kawthar. What is kawthar? One of the meanings is, Nahrun fil Jannah, a river in Jannah. But the Prophet ﷺ does not have access to this river while he's living in Mecca. So what is the import of this prophetic past? We also find it in the Hebrew Bible. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, it says, Qi yelid yulad lanu. Indeed, a son or a child will be given to us. But this verb in the Hebrew, yulad, is pu'al, perfect, passive. But it's translated in the future. What is the rhetorical import? of the prophetic past is that it represents a guarantee, a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this conversation will take place between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Isa alayhi salam. When will it take place? According to Imam al-Suyuti, fil qiyamah, on the day of judgment in front of the whole of humanity, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَنْيَمْ God will say, O oh, Jesus, the son of Mary. And interestingly, Ibn Maryam, this guttural alif, is retained in the orthography uh, to emphasize, as it were, that Isa alayhi salam is not the literal son of God. He is the son of Maryam. And Maryam alayhi salam is great in her own right. In fact, Imam Ibn Hazm and Imam al-Qurtubi, both of them insist that Maryam alayhi salam was actually a prophet. So what is the question that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to pose to Isa alayhi salam in front of the whole of humanity? He says, أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ Ah, this Hamza at the beginning of this statement is istifhamiyya. In other words, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking a question here. And he says, أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ Very interesting in its syntax, in its construction here. The verb قُلْتَ, the morphology of this verb suggests second person masculine singular. Right? Did you say, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here, he says, anta also. This seems somewhat redundant. But the rhetorical import of that is to stress, did you actually say, did you say to humanity, what did he say? What is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asking? Ittakhiduni wa ummiya ilahini min dunillah. Did you ever say to the people, and ittakhada, form eight, it's reflexive. Did you ever say, take me? for yourselves and my mother as deities other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam uh, Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad, as well as Imam al-Suyuti, both of them say here that when this question is posed to Isa alayhi salam, he begins to tremble, he, be, he begins to shake and quake from the force of the question. Now interestingly here, Western polemicists, they look at this ayah of the Quran and they say, look, the Quran has it wrong. The Quran has a a strange conception, an erroneous conception of the Trinity, that the Quran conceives it as being somewhat of a holy family, the Father, Son, and the Holy Mother. But this is not a necessary conclusion. I don't see this verse as denouncing the Trinity, at least not in this verse. 
I see this verse as denouncing what's known as Christolatry, the deification of Christ alayhi salam, and Mariolatry, the deification of Maryam alayhi salam. And we're going to talk about how Christ was deified, but how was Maryam alayhi salam deified? A quick example, the Third Ecumenical Council and 431 of the Common Era, the Council of Ephesus, it was voted upon by the Proto-Orthodox bishops that Maryam alayhi salam is Theotokos, which some have translated as the mother of God, but a more accurate translation is the bearer or carrier of God. So to suggest that an entity has the power or capacity to carry or bear God, to handle God, is to impute upon that entity a divine quality. So I don't see this verse as denouncing the Trinity, nor intermediacy through Maryam, nor even the explicit worship of Mary, but rather assigning Mary divine attributes, deifying Maryam alayhi salam. Now listen to the response of Isa alayhi salam. Qala subhanaka. He says, glory be to you. And, and linguistically here, this is called maf'ul mutlaq bi fi'lin mahdhuf, an absolute, an infinitive absolute for an apocopated verb. So it's very direct, it's very exclamatory. Glory be to you. Now I'm reminded of Matthew chapter 7 verses 21 to 23. And the parallel of this is found in Luke chapter 13, which means it originated from the Q source document, which scholars of Western Academy believe to be the best and most accurate uh, source of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. This is what Jesus is reported to have said in Matthew 7, 21 to 23. He says, not everyone who says to me, Kurie, kurie, in the Greek, master, master, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one, ha poion thelema tu patras, but only the one who does the will of the Father. Now let's take a quick excursion here to talk about the term Father in the New Testament. Imam al-Ghazali, as well as Ahmad ibn Alawi, they both say that when you read the term Father in the Injil, in the New Testament, think Rabb. Ab means Rabb. What, who is your Rabb? The Rabb is the one who takes care of you in stages, as our parents take care of us in stages. So there's a, there's a relationship here between Rabb and Ab. Interestingly enough, if you look at these five great prophets, at least four of them did not have their biological fathers in their lives. If you look, for example, at uh, Adam, at, uh, at Ibrahim, alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, his father was not Azar, that was his uncle, and it's permissible to call your uncle Ab. Uh, well, like he says in Surah Maryam, he says, Ya Abati. According to Ibn Hisham, the name of the father of Ibrahim alayhi salam was Tarikh or Tarakh, as he's called in the book of Genesis. So Ibrahim alayhi salam has Tarbiya Rabbaniya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who raised him. In that sense, Ibrahim alayhi salam is the son of God. In that metaphorical sense, not in the literal sense. And this is what Imam al-Ghazali is trying to impart upon us. If you look at Musa alayhi salam, he did not have his biological father. He was raised in the house of Fir'aun, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took care of him and raised him. He is tarbiya rabbaniya. Isa alayhi salam did not have a father to begin with. Tarbiya rabbaniya. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, his father died before he was born. He was raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in that sense that Allah was taking care of him. Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fil. Allah speaking to him directly. The verb is second masculine, singular. Rabbuka, have you not seen or understood the significance of your Lord as to what he did to the companions of the elephant? In other words, why do you think I did that? I was taking care of you. That was the year that you were going to be born. Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa wa wajadaka dalan fahada. Did he not find you an orphan and give you shelter? Did he not find you searching and enamored and give you guidance? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the Prophet وسلم, that he raised him up in stages. This is the meaning, according to the New Testament, of, of pater, of abba, of father. It means the rub, the one who takes care of you. It denotes God imminent. And we find this analogy. This, this terminology in the Old and New Testament. In the New Testament, of course, Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said in the Sermon on the Mount, in Syriac, his actual language, he said, Avunda vashmayo nithqata shmok, our Father who art in heaven, all of us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. If we look into Psalm 82.6, it says, Kullakem bane elyon, all of you are sons of the Most High God. 
In fact, in Isaiah chapter 64, one of the prayers of the prophet Isaiah is, Atta Adonai Avinu, you are the Lord our Father. So this is very Hebraic type language, and it's meant to be majaz, it's meant to be figurative language, denoting an intimate relationship between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his servants. So let's go back to Matthew 7, 21. Only those who do the will of the Father. And he continues, on that day, many will come to me and say, Kurie, Kurie, Master, Master, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and in your name perform many dunames, which is the Greek word, means miracles of power, you know, healings, raising the dead, walking on water. Listen to the response of Isa alayhi salam as recorded by Matthew. He says, Then I will tell them plainly, Ude pate egnon humas, never did I know you. Apokorate ap emu. Apokorate, present active imperative. In Greek, it calls for the action to be prolonged, meaning depart from me and stay away from me. Hoi ergazamanoi tein anomian. You workers of lawlessness, of a nomos, you antinomians, you rejectors of the sharia. You see, without the sharia, to ground them in sound theology, many took to deifying Isa alayhi salam. Some have dubbed this as Ghazalian mirror Christology, that when the, when the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reflected off the, the purified heart of Isa alayhi salam, those who weren't grounded in sound theology, those who did not follow the sharia, they didn't know the mitzvot of Bani Israel, when they saw that reflection, they mistook the illuminated re re reflection for the illuminating source and began to deify Isa alayhi salam. It is as if they saw the a uh, reflection of the moon in a still lake and jumped into the lake in hopes of grabbing the moon only to find themselves drowning. Yet how great is the difference between the actual moon and its reflection in the lake? How much more vast is the difference between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a human being? There's nothing like the likes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whatsoever. We'll continue with this discussion next time inshallah ta'ala. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'een. This is our second session. We're talking about Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam, our master Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, peace be upon her. So last time we were talking about this verse at the end of Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 116, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in the Yawm Al-Qiyamah will ask Isa alayhi salam, did you ever say to humanity, take me or my mother as gods in addition or other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we said that the initial response of Isa alayhi salam is direct and exclamatory. He says, Subhanaka, glory be to you. He continues according to the Quran, Ma yakunu li, ma yakunu. Yakunu is an imperfect tense verb. And usually in Arabic, the imperfect tense is negated with a lam alif, like la yaf'alu. But the ma is used for strong negation. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wa najmi idha hawa, taking an oath by the star when it goes down. Ma dalla sahibukum wa ma ghawa. Your companion, meaning the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is not uh, astray or being misled. Wa ma yantiku, wa ma yantiku anil hawa. And he never speaks from his hawa. The Prophet وسلم, everything he says is wahi, is guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said sallallahu alayhi He says, by the one who sent me in truth, nothing comes out of this pointing to his blessed mouth except for the truth. So Isa alayhi salam's response here, Ma yakunu, never will it be for me, li, khabar kana muqaddam, never will it be for me to say what I had no right to say. This is his response, Isa alayhi salam, according to the Qur'an, he continues, In kuntu qultu, if I said that, in is a conditional particle, faqad alimta, then you would have known that, ta'lamu ma fi nafsi, wa la a'lamu ma fi nafsik, innaka anta allamul ghuyub. You know what is in, uh, 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 you know what is in myself, well I do not know what is in yourself. Verily you are the knower of the unseen. Interestingly, if you look at the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 29, which is usually the Gospel that most Christians will point to, to sort of prove that Isa is God. However, in the Gospel of John, and we'll analyze some of these 
ayat in coming sessions, these verses in the Bible in coming sessions. John 12, 29, he says, according to the Greek, he says, Horte ego ex emautu uk eleilasa. He says, from myself I have said nothing. Al ha pempsas me patras, but the Father who sent me, autas moi entolein edoken. He has given me a commandment. Isa is saying in the Gospel of John, in the Gospel of John, that God is commanding him. We read in the Quran that Isa salam is reported to have said, bisalati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has commanded me the prayer and charity as long as I live. But going back to John 12, 29, that he has given me a commandment. T-A-P-O ti leleso. What to say and how I should say it. Both of these Greek verbs are in the subjunctive. In other words, Isa alayhi salam is receiving the ipsisama verba, the very words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As a prophet, he is speaking the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but also he speaks with the ipsisama vox, the voice of God. He speaks with God's authority as a prophet. In John chapter 16, verse 24, he says, Kai, Halagas han akuete uk estin emas. The word you hear or the teaching you hear is not mine. He continues in John 14, 1. He says, pisteu ete, present active imperative. Again, in Greek, the present active imperative calls for the action to be prolonged. He says, believe eston theon. Believe in the God. Definite article in Greek means God with, an, with a capital G. Believe in the God, believe in God, in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He continues, kai ace e me pisteu ate, and also believe in me. Believe in God and also believe in me. Believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and believe in the Messenger of Allah. Clearly here, God and Isa alayhi salam are mutually exclusive. He continues according to the Quran, ma qultu lahum illa ma amartani bihi. I did not say anything to them. And if you look at this, uh, from a standpoint of syntactical exegesis, you have ma and then you have illa. This is called an affirmation after a negation. If bat ba'da nafyin. And this is one of the strongest ways to make a statement in Arabic. For example, we all know how to say la ilaha illa Allah. There is no God except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alameen. We did not send you except as a mercy to all the worlds. So Isa alayhi salam, according to the Quran here, is saying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I did not say anything to them except what you ordered me to say. Allaha, rabbi wa rabbukum. I told them to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, my Lord and your Lord. Now if you look at the high priestly prayer of Isa alayhi salam, going back to the Gospel of John, again, this is a Gospel that oftentimes is quoted to uh, prove for a lot of Christians that Isa alayhi salam is God. In John 17, 3, I call a theological anchor of the Gospel of John. This is what Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said according to the original Greek. He says, Aute de estin he eonias zoe. This is eternal life. This is eternal life. This is salvation. He's going to tell you. Hina ginosko sensei. That they might know you. Who is he speaking to? According to John 17, 1, he's talking to Hapatras. He's talking to the Father, to the Rabb. He's talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Eternal life is to know you. Ton manon aleithinon theon in the Greek. Which means the only one who is God. The one and only true God. Theon, monon, and theon, you put them together, you get the word monotheism. He's teaching us tawheed, that the Father, the Rabb, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the only one who is truly God. And, kai han apastelas yesun Christos, and to know the one whom you sent, Jesus Christ. This is eternal life, to know God, the only true God. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only true God and also to know the one sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is Isa alayhi salam. Why to know, ginoskosen, comes from the word ginosis or gnosis. If you knew Allah and His Messenger, if you knew them well, then you would have agape, unconditional love for them. You would have mahabba. As the Quran says, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That I did not create jinn and ins except to worship, Ibn Abbas said, 
illa liya'budun can be understood as illa liya'rifun, except to know me, to know, have ma'rifah, to have knowledge of God, gnosis of God. And if we had gnosis of God, then we would necessarily have mahabbah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this is the essence of the Abrahamic tradition, the oneness of God and the love of God and humanity. In Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 31, a Jewish lawyer comes to Isa alayhi salam, according to Mark, the earliest of the synoptic gospels. And he says to him in the Greek language, poia estin en tole pro te panton, according to the Greek of the gospel of Mark. He says to him, Master, Rabbani, uh, uh, Rabbi, what is the greatest of the commandments? Listen to the response of Isa alayhi salam. He quotes from the Torah. He says in Hebrew, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says one, God is one, and, and one means one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is wahid and ahad. He is one and he is one and only, he is unique. This is the response of Isa alayhi salam to this Jewish lawyer. He continues, he says, Ve'ahafta et Adonai. And here in Hebrew, we have a perfect with conjunctive vav, which the meaning is future, and there's an element of the imperative. And you will love, you must love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. This is the essence of the Abrahamic teaching. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, La tadkhulu jannata hatta tu'minu, wa la tu'minu hatta tahabbu. None of you will enter paradise until you truly believe, and none of you will truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? And they said, yes. He said, afshu salama baynakum. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Now let's look at one of these so-called proof texts that are often used by Trinitarian Christians to prove that Isa alayhi salam is God. John 1.1, 1, 1, the very first verse of the prologue of the Gospel of John. This is how it's translated usually by Christians. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why is this important to analyze from the standpoint of syntactical exegesis? Is because the Quran seems to have an intertextual relationship with this prologue. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he refers to Isa alayhi salam as kalimatu minhu, a word from him. The only other text that mentions Jesus as being a word of God is the prologue of John's gospel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says about Yahya alayhi salam, musaddiqan bi kalimatin min Allah, that he bears there's witness concerning a word of God, and there's almost the exact same sentiment or statement in the prologue of John's gospel. There's an intertextual relationship between the prologue of John and the Quran. So how do we understand this if it says that Jesus was God and the word was God? Well, let's look at the original Greek. The Greek says, en arche en halagos. It doesn't say in the beginning. There's no definite article before beginning. It says in a beginning was the word, a relative beginning, not the absolute beginning, a relative beginning. The beginning of creation was the word. And what is the word? The fos to Christu, according to the rest of the prologue, the light of the Messiah, the ruh, the soul of the Messiah. In other words, one of the first entities that God created was the light or the soul, the ruh of the Messiah. And the word was with God. How do we understand that? The light of the Messiah, the soul of the Messiah was with God in a state of mystical union with God. We were all there. Yom alast, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked us, Alastu bi rabbikum, qalu bala, am I not your Lord? We said yes. Imam Abu al-Qasim al-Junaid, he says, this is the goal of this life, to get back to Yom alast. And mystical union, al-jama'ah, Right? What is called theosis in Eastern Orthodoxy is remembering that great day in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in which we were united with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a dualistic annihilation in God, where the wahdaniyah and ahadiyah and fardaniyah, the oneness, the uniqueness, and the individuality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always upheld. It's not a henosis. It's not ittihad. It's not a merging of our essence with the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because nothing is ontologically equal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is mystical union that is dualistic and the word was with God. And then it says, Christians usually translate this last part, and the word was God. However, the Greek says, 
says, Kai theos ein halagos. There's no definite article here before the word God, like we had in the previous statement, that the word was with ton theon, the God, God with a capital G. So what does it mean? And the word was a God? Well, according to Daniel Wallace in his Greek Beyond the Basics, he says that pre-verbal indefinite nouns are more often attributive than substantive in the New Testament. So what does it mean? A God, that's pre-verbal, it means the word was theistic, it was godly, it was holy, it was sanctified, it was lordly. You see in Exodus chapter 7, verse 1, God tells Moses, I will send you as Elohim, as God unto Pharaoh, and Aaron as your Navi. Does it mean that Moses is God? No, it means Moses speaks with the authority of God. Moses is sanctified. Moses is godly. Moses is holy. In fact, Isa alayhi salam is quoted in the Quran as saying, Kunu Rabbaniyin in Surah Ali Imran. Kunu Rabbaniyin. And Imam Asyuti says there's an alif and a noon there. For extra emphasis, what does kunu rabbaniyin mean? Be lordly, be godly. Or as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu said, and there's some weakness in the tradition, takhallaku bi akhlaqillah. Adorn yourself with the character of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibn Ajiba, in his commentary on the 99 names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says there are three elements to all of the names of Allah. For example, the name Malik means owner, which is related etymologically to Malik, which means king. He says there's ta'alluq of this name. Ta'alluq means that we have some sort of connection to this name. How do we connect to the name Malik, that Allah is the owner, is that we realize that we are his servants. This is our ta'alluq. Then the second element is called ta'alluq. We assimilate something of this name. How do we assimilate Malik? Well, just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the owner of everything and the king and master of everything, we need to know how to master our lower selves. We become the king of our lower selves. And then the third element is tahakkuk, to taste or experience the realities, become annihilated in God's love and character so that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only object of our love and concern. We become sanctified agents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the earth. At this point, we're gonna, we're gonna stop this session. Inshallah ta'ala, we're gonna continue next time uh, looking at more ayat from the Quran, verses from the Bible. Rabbana zidna ilma, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is our third session. We're talking about our master, Isa ibn Maryam, peace be upon both of them. We've been talking about ayah number 116 of Surah Al-Ma'idah, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask Isa alayhi salam, point blank on the yawm al-qiyamah, did you ever say that your God or your mother is God other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the response of Isa alayhi salam, as we said, مَا يَكُونُ لِي and aqula ma laysa li bihaq. Never will it be for me to say what I had no right to say. In fact, never does Isa alayhi salam, even according to any of the four gospels, canonical gospels in the New Testament, never does he say, I am God or worship me. It simply does not exist. Now, interestingly, there's a verse in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 79, Ali Imran, ayah number 79, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مَا كَانَ لِبَشَرٍ أَيْ يُؤْتِهُ اللَّهُ الْكِتَابَ وَالْحُكْمَ وَالنَّبُوَّةِ ثُمَّ يَقُولُ لِلنَّاسِ كُونُ عِبَادًا لِي مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ It is impossible for a human being to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the revelation and wisdom and prophecy then to say to the people, be my worshippers, worship me, be my slaves, uh, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, Imam al-Suyuti gives us the sabab al-nuzul of this ayah. He says, When nazala lamma qala nasara najran, this was revealed from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when the Christians of Najran came and they said, Inna Isa amarahum an yattakhiduhu rabban, that Isa alayhi salam ordered us to take him as a lord. Walamma talaba ba'du al muslimin as sajuda lahu, and even some of the Muslims requested, let's make sajda to him. This ayah was revealed. Now in the New Testament, Isa alayhi salam, Jesus peace be upon him, according to the New Testament, quite often quotes the Torah. It is his most cogent argument. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, مُصَدِّقَ لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَ مِنَ Torah, quoting Isa alayhi salam, that Isa alayhi salam said, I confirm the Torah which is with me. 
that there's a clear, common Abrahamic trajectory of theology that we see with Musa alayhi salam, with Isa alayhi salam, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam. For example, in Matthew chapter 9 verse 13, Isa alayhi salam quotes Hosea 6, 6 from the Old Testament. He says, Ki chesed chafatsti, velo zavach. I require mercy, not sacrifice. Vada'at Elohim me oloth, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. It's about mercy and knowledge, not sacrifice and burnt offerings. In Luke chapter uh, 4, Isa alayhi salam will quote from Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 20, when he's being tempted by Satan, according to the Gospel of, uh, of Luke. And he says to Satan, Eth Adonai Elohecha Tira. Very interesting. Hebrew is not an inflected language. There's no mu'arab, like we have in Arabic, sometimes we say muslimun, musliman, muslimin, right? It's inflected, whether it's a nominative or accusative or genitive, but biblical Hebrew is no longer inflected. Maybe ancient Paleo-Hebrew was, according to many linguists, but biblical Hebrew isn't. So it's very clear the word order is very important. You have verb, you have subject and object. But here in Deuteronomy 10.30, quoted by Jesus in Luke chapter 4, the direct object is brought to the very beginning of the sentence because there is a direct object marker in Hebrew. What's the effect of bringing the, the, the direct object to the beginning of a sentence? This maf'ul muqaddam it's called. It denotes emphasis and exclusivity. For example, in Al-Fatiha, we don't say na'buduka wa nasta'inuka. We worship you and we ask you for help. We say iyyaka na'budu. We bring the direct object forward which denotes exclusivity and emphasis. So here Isa alayhi salam is saying, Eth Adonai, the Lord your God only will you fear, O to and him alone Ta'avud, you will worship only the Lord your God. Now, Luke translates this verse into Greek as, proskune says kurian tan theonsu, that you must revere the Lord your God, tan theon, definite article on God again. Tan theon means the God. Isa alayhi salam is never called ha theos, God with a definite article, anywhere in the New Testament. And then he says, kai o tu, Mano latreoses, and to him alone will you render worship. Now, in Koine Greek, in New Testament Greek, there are two words for worship used in the New Testament. The first word is proskuneo, which is a compound word that comes from the preposition pros, which means toward, and the word kuon, which means a dog. What do dogs do when they see their masters? They kiss their hands. So in the New Testament says that the disciples worshipped Jesus, usually how Christians will translate, proskuneo, when the disciples quote unquote worshipped Jesus, like the King James Version says that, the Greek is proskuneo, which means they revered him, they respected him, they kissed his hand. In John chapter 9, Jesus heals a blind man. He sees him in the temple of Solomon later, and this man thanks Jesus, and the Greek says he made proskuneo towards him. Are we really to believe that a Jewish man inside the Temple of Solomon is worshiping Jesus as God and committing adult, uh, uh, idolatry? No. In fact, in the Bible, the same verb is used to show respect to Jewish high priests and angels. They are not being worshipped as God. The Hebrew avad, the, the verb avad, the cognate is abada ya'budu, is translated as latreo in Greek. And this is the verb for worship that is only due to God. It is never used of Isa alayhi salam in the New Testament. In fact, Christ himself says in Luke chapter 4, verse 8, kai autu manu latreuses, and him alone, meaning God, will you render worship as God, because he is the only God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, the first words of Isa alayhi salam according to the Qur'an, are interesting. He says, Inni Abdullah. It's the great Qur'anic I am statement, right? There's I am statements in the Gospel of John that Christians qualify as claims of deity by Isa alayhi salam. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Before Abraham was, I am. I am the good shepherd, so on and so forth. Here we have an I am statement in the Qur'an. Inni, a combination of inna, harfa the emphatic particle, and ana, 
the independent pronoun, meaning I or I am. Indeed, I am the servant of God. He has given me revelation and has made me a prophet. And made me blessed wheresoever I am. And has commanded me to prayer and charity as long as I live. Also, we have the beautiful ayah in Surah Ali Imran, ayah number 51, quoting Isa alayhi salam, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'budu, hadha siratun mustaqeem. Indeed, Allah, not inna Rabbi Allah, inna Allah, that the lafdun jalala, right, the, the expression of exaltation is accusative because it follows inna, indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord. Worship him, fi'il amr, present active imperative. Worship him. This is a straight path. This is eternal life. Now at the end of the Gospel of uh, John, at the end of the prologue, the author says, Thayan udes heoraken popate, that no one has ever seen God. Manogenes huyas, manogenes huyas, usually translated by uh, Christians as the only begotten son. But monogenes, from mono in genus, means the one of a kind, literally what it means, the one of a kind, the unique huyas, son. When you see it, as we said before in previous sessions, when you see the word father in the New Testament, think Rab, God imminent, the one who guides us in stages. God's imminence, not literally God is our Father. Think Lord. When you see the word huyas in the New Testament, don't think literal son. Think abd. Think a servant, a special and sanctified servant. In fact, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the pneuma of God, meaning they're guided, these are the huyoi theu. These are the sons of God. Therefore, we can call God, Paul says, Abba. We can call him Father. Why? It's figurative. It's majaz. It's an honorific title. Huyas tu theyu in the New Testament. The Son of God is called an idafa of, taf, of takrim and tashrif. The annexation of, uh, of, uh, of, of honor and of majesty. Like we say, the Kaaba is Baytullah. We don't mean to say literally that God resides in a house? No. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is transcendent of space, time, and materiality. But to show tashrif and takrim, to show uh, honor and majesty to the Kaaba, it's called Baytullah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, they say God has begotten children. Bal ibadun mukramun. Bal ibadun mukramun. Rather, they are servants raised to honor. Raised to honor. So this is how we should understand manogenes huyas. So let's look at that verse again. No one has at any time seen God. People saw Jesus, therefore he cannot be God. The simple deductive argument. But the monogenes huyas, the one of a kind special servant of God, haon es ton kalpon tu patras, who is in the bosom of the Father, who is on the chest of the Father, who is in the heart of the Father. What does that mean? Who is beloved of the Father, beloved of the Rabb, Isa alayhi salam, is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a kainas exegesato, that one, meaning Jesus, exegetes, literally, exegetes the Father, explains the Father, reveals the Father, gives commentary about the Rabb, about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not the God, he's not Tanthayan, he reveals and explains and ep explicates the Father. Christ is the perfect reflection of God on earth, the perfected and sanctified agent of God who reflects God's attributes at a human level. Just as the moon reflects the sun, the prophets reflect the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a non-absolute and human level. This is what Jesus meant when he said in John chapter 10, verse 30, Ego kai ha pater hen esmen. I and the Father are one, one on the level of obedience, disobedience, will, intention, born out of love, not one on the level ontology. We find this type of oneness in the Quran between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 80, Mayuti ar rasul faqad ata Allah. Whoever obeys the messenger is obeying Allah. Not because the messenger is essentially or ontologically Allah. No. 
because the obedience of the messenger is equal, is one with the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you obey the messenger, it is as if you are obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Surah Al-Anfal, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that you did not throw when you threw, Allah threw. Are we to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala incarnated into the Prophet وسلم, and threw some stones? No, what does it mean? It means that all of the actions of the Prophet وسلم, are guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Imam Abu Qasim al Junaid said about the famous Hadith Qudsi, my servant does not draw close unto me with anything more beloved than his fara'id, than his obligations. And continues to draw near unto me with his nawafil hatta uhibba until I love him. Then I become the eye by which he sees, and the hand by which he holds, and the foot by which he walks. And if you were to ask anything from me, I shall surely give it to him. Are we to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala literally becomes our eye and our hand and our foot? No. What does it mean? It means that all of our limbs become guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we actualize our Islam that we become sanctified agents of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Another example from Surah At-Tawbah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu rasuluhu ahaq, Wallahu rasuluhu ahaqu an yurduhu. Allah and His Messenger, two subjects mentioned. It is more befitting that you all please Him. Who at the end, the pronoun is third masculine singular, not the dual, even though there are two subjects. So what's happening here? Is this a grammatical error? Imam al-Qurtubi says, no, it's singular because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to demonstrate an intimate relationship between himself and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the sense that if you please the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then you are automatically pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One on the level of obedience, disobedience, will and intention born out of love, not one ontologically. That is impossible. That's not the Abrahamic tradition. So in this sense, to use Johannan language, the language of the Gospel of John, the Prophet is in the bosom of God. He is in the heart of God. He is in the eye of God, as Allah says in the Quran, فَاصْبِرْ لِحُكْمِ رَبِّكْ فَإِنَّكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا So be patient as to the coming of the command of thy Lord, for verily you are in our eyes. What does that mean? In layman's terms, it means relax, I love you. Relax, I love you. That's what it means. And the proof that Isa alayhi salam meant this oneness relationally and not literally is that in his high priestly prayer in John 17 verse 21, listen to what he says about the disciples. So that all might be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us. So what does that mean? If it's a oneness, ontological oneness, an essential oneness, that they're the same substance or co-substantial, is Jesus praying that the disciples also become gods? No, he's praying for their mystical union with God, that they're united in God in love, that there's a, there's a unity of will and intention born out of love. Jesus tells Mary the Magdalene in John 20, 17, he says, Anabeino prastan patera mu kai patera humon. I am going to ascend to my father and your father. Remember we said when you hear the word father, think Rabb, Rabbi wa Rabbukum. I'm going to ascend unto my Rabb and your love, Rabb. Kai theon mu, kai theon humon. And my God and your God. I'm going to ascend unto my father and your father. My God and your God. Jesus says he has a God. There is a God of Jesus. Who is this God of Jesus? If Jesus has a God, how can he be God? Are there two gods? There's one God. The God is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In Mark 10, 18, a scribe comes to Christ and he says, according to the Greek, didaskale agathe, good master. What must I do to gain eternal life? Point blank question. How do I go to heaven? Listen to the response of Jesus. He says, ti meleges agathan. Udes agathas, a meheis, hatheas. In Greek here, Greek is highly inflected. Mark brings the direct object forward. Why does he do that? To emphasize the direct object. Why me are you calling good? Conventional translations don't do justice. 
They say, why are you calling me good? No, the object is brought forward. Why me? He's almost offended. Why me are you calling good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Follow the commandments, he says, the mitzvot, and you shall enter the life. So I want to end this session by reading the first few of the Ten Commandments that deal with theology. This is what Jesus is telling us to follow. He says, follow the commandments. Let's read a couple and then we'll end the session, inshallah ta'ala. The first few commandments deal with theology. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 to 5. It says, Anochi Adonai Elohecha, Asher Chutzeiteka, Me Eretz Mitzrayim, Me Beit Avodah. I am the Lord your God, the one who brought you out from the house of Egypt, from the house of bondage. Lo yihye lacha Elohim acharim al panai. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Lo taase lacha fesel the kul tamuna. Thou shalt not make the likeness of anything asher b'shamayim mimal of anything in the heavens above. Va asher ba'aritz mitachat or from the earth below. Va asher or anything from the seas beneath the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor worship them. Because I am the Lord, your God. This is the theology of Musa alayhi salam. This is the theology that's confirmed by Isa alayhi salam. And this is the theology that is confirmed in the Quran by the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Rabbana zidna ilma. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge. We'll pick this up again in the next session. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. In this session, we're going to look at theological consistency of normative Christian theology as it relates to Isa alayhi salam, in other words, normative Christology in the Christian faith. As we said in the last session, two of the most iconic and theologically foundational statements of Isa alayhi salam are in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse 30, Inni Abdullah, that I am indeed the servant of Allah. And chapter 3, verse 51, Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abuduh hadha siratul mustaqim. Indeed, Allah is my Lord and your Lord. Worship Him, this is the straight path. Now I want to preface my comments by saying Muslim hermeneutics of the Bible uh, can be a sensitive topic. As a Muslim biblicist myself, I propose in my dissertation, for example, that our approach to the biblical text must be on the same level as the great masters of religion of the past, for example, Abu Rayhan al-Biruni or Imam al-Shahrastani, who is usually considered to be the wadi'r, the founder of this discipline known as al-Milal wa nihal nations and creeds or comparative theology. Also, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in his rad, his uh, his refutation of Christian theology, Ibn Taymiyyah in his Rad, Ibn Umar al-Biqa'i in his dissertation, in his uh, Dia Tessaran, his Gospel, Harmony of the Four Gospels. Our approach must be what I call polymerenic, it's a combination of the word uh, polemic, the, the Greek word polemikos means warlike. This is when the text of the Bible in Christianity is attacked with faulty knowledge. And the other side of that you have the arenic approach from the Greek word eireni. Now people who, who engage in Christ, with Christianity from a Muslim perspective, from an arenical approach, they approach the text and say, well, these are saying basically the same things in Islam and Christianity are no different. They tend to secret, syncretize religions, Tawheed and Trinity, as, uh, as explicated by Abu Ja'far al-Tahawi and St. Augustine, are really two sides of the same coin. And obviously that's not being true to the traditions. Definitely there are two different religions, two different theologies. But to be polymerenic means to be critical, but also reflects rigorous academic sophistication. So I speak now in the capacity of an academic. I mean no disrespect to anyone, but we are going to be a bit critical. Theological consistency. Isa alayhi salam is reported to have said in the Quran, Torah, that I confirm the Torah which is with me, which is before me. Now the Nicene Creed, 
was called by Constantine, or the Council of Nicaea, I should say, was called by Constantine, the first Christian emperor, to solve or to resolve the Arian controversy of 325 of the Common Era. So this is the creedal exposition of the faith by the 318 bishops. So I'm just going to quickly go through the Nicene Creed, not all of it, but most of it, uh, do a loose translation uh, from the original Greek just to give you a feel of Orthodox Christian uh, Christology, belief about Jesus. It says, we believe in one God, the Father, the creator of all things seen and unseen. And we also believe in one, Kurian, which they translate as Lord, the Son of God, begotten from the Father uniquely, from the same essence as the Father, the same usias. Then it says, theon ek theyu, God from God, phos ek photas, light from light, theon eleithinon ek theyu eleithinu, true God from true God, which is interesting because Jesus in 17, 17, 3 of John, as we stated, says that the Father is ton mayon, ton manon eleithinon theon, that the Father is the only true God. It goes on to say the famous statement, genethenta u poethenta, begotten, not made, begotten, not created, hamausian tu patri, uh, sub, co-substantial of the same essence with the Father, through whom all things were made, and in, uh, in the heavens and the earth, and for the sake of us, men or human beings, and for the sake of our salvation, came down and sarcothenta, assumed flesh, and anthropesanta, and became a man, and suffered and was resurrected on the third day. So that's the gist of the Nicene Creed. So here's what we know about Trinitarian Christianity, what it teaches. Number one, God became a man, right? St. Augustine said, uh, factus es Deus homo, that God became a man. Augustine said, Deus incarnatus, God became incarnated, the incarnated God, literally became enfleshed. So God became a man. Number two, God sacrificed his son, who was innocent and sinless. In fact, technically, since the father and son are the same uh, ontologically, God actually committed, according to this belief, an act of self-immolation. Nonetheless, the son was killed and he was innocent. Number three, the son, meaning Jesus, died to atone for our sins. He died for our sins. Number four, he died by being hanged on a tree. He was crucified. Number five, he is commemorated by partaking of his blood. It's called the Eucharist. It's a sacrament in all churches, the Catholic, the Protestant, and Eastern Orthodox. The Catholics believe in a doctrine known as transubstantiation, in which they believe that at Mass, the Holy Spirit descends and transforms the essence the essence of the bread and the wine into the literal flesh and blood of Jesus, while the accidents of the bread and the wine remain the same. Now, okay, the Torah says, let's look at the Torah, and Maimonides, the great product of Muslim Spain, the great Jewish philosopher and theologian, said that the Torah, the first five books of Moses, represents the ipsissima verba, the very words of God similar to our concept of the Qur'an. And the rest of the Old Testament, the Nabim and the Ketubim, the prophets and the writings, is the very voice of God, inspired uh, to prophets and sages and historians. So the Torah, the first five books, the Pentateuch for Maimonides, uh, has the highest level of revelation. Numbers 23, 19 says, Lo Ish'el is very clear. God is not a man. God is not a man. In Hosea 11.9, if we go to the prophets, he says, Ki el anochi velo ish. Ki in, in Hebrew is the equivalent of inna, the harfa tokid, the emphatic particle in Arabic. Indeed, I am God and not a man, meaning they're mutually exclusive. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to John chapter 4, verse 24, he says, Penoma ha theos, 
The God is spirit. God is a spiritual being. He transcends space, time, and materiality. There's nothing like the likes of God whatsoever. Maimonides says in point number three of his principles of Jewish emunah, of Jewish iman, point number three of 13, he says, Einahu guf. He is not, guf in Hebrew means jism, a corpus, a soma, a body. He is not a body, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَيْنْ لَوْ سُمْ دِمْيَانْ kalal, And there is not to him the likeness of anything. So to say that God became a man is not theologically consistent. Okay, point number two. In Exodus chapter 20, verse 13, we read, لَوْ تِرْسَخْ which usually is translated, thou shalt not kill. But there's capital punishment in the Old Testament. What this really means is thou shalt not commit murder. What is murder? The killing of an innocent person. If a judge orders an innocent man killed to save another, then that is a breach of justice and thus murder. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 32, وَكَتَبْنَ عَلَى بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ أَنَّهُ مَنْ قَتَلَ نَفْسًا بِغَيْرِ نَفْسٍ أَوْ فَسَادٍ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَكَأَنَّمَا قَتَلَ النَّاسَ جَمِيعًا That we prescribe for the Bani Israel, the children of Israel, that if a person is killed, if a person is killed for other than uh, justice, like uh, someone is murdered, then there's capital punishment, or for spreading corruption upon the earth, then it is as if he has killed the whole of humanity. So God ordering the death of an innocent person is not theologically consistent. <clears throat> In Deuteronomy 24.17, we read, Ish becheto yumatu. Every man shall be put to death for his own sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَزِرُوا وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى That no bearer of burdens can bear the burdens of another. In Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, in the Nabim, in the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, we read, the soul that sins, it shall die. The, 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 the iniquity of the son shall not be upon the father. The iniquity of the father shall not be upon the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked, wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked would turn from his wickedness and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. What does it mean to turn to God? The word in Hebrew is teshuva, means toba. Toba, taba, yatubu in Arabic, in its etymology, logatan, means to turn, to reorient. But we use it to mean toba, to repent. So this is the way to make right with God, according to the prophets of Bani Israel, is that we make toba. In fact, remember Matthew chapter 9. When Jesus quotes Hosea 6.6, 6, I require mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Ki chesed chafatzti velo zevach v'da'at Elohim me'oloth. The, soteri the soteriology of Luke Acts, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts, is vastly different than the Nicene Creed. In Luke Acts, Jesus is only called Savior in the sense that he tells you about sin and how to deal with sin. He doesn't vicariously atone for sin. And this is demonstrated in the beautiful parable of the prodigal son the pericope known as the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, when a man has two sons, one son stays with him, the other one uh, is musrif, he's, a, he's prodigal, he's a spendthrift, and he's a sinner, and he leaves his father, and then he comes back years later, and he sees his father from a distance, and his father opens out his arms to him, and hugs him, and welcomes him back. What is the moral of this parable? Is it about blood sacrifice? No, it's about toba, teshuva, it's about repentance. This is the teaching of Isa alayhi salam, according to the Gospel of Luke. Next point, number four, Deuteronomy chapter 21, 23 says, whoever is hanged on a tree is qillat Elohim, is accursed by God. And in fact, Paul says in the book of Galatians that Jesus became a curse for us. Very interesting. However, the Quran says the opposite. وَجَعَلَنِي مُبَارَكًا أَيْنَمَا كُنْتُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala quoting Isa alayhi salam says that 
that he has made me blessed wheresoever I am. In fact, the Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّيَ لَهُمْ They did not kill nor crucify Jesus. And if you look at all of these so-called crucifixion prophecies that Trinitarian Christians will say prophesize or foreshadow or are typologies of the crucifixion, none of them, not a single one of them, say the Christ. None of them say HaMashiach or Mashiach in the Hebrew. Absolutely none of them. However, we read in Psalm 20, Psalm 20, verse 6, David writes, Ata yada'atiki hushya Adonai Mashiacho. He says, I know that God will save his Messiah. He shall hear him from his holy heaven with the saving power of his right hand. In fact, the name Yeshua in Aramaic is a passive participle, meaning the one who is saved by God, according to the lexicon Strong's Concordance. And finally, Leviticus chapter 3, verse 17 says, وَكُلْ دَامْ لَوْ تُكَيْلُوا خُقَاخْ الْأُولَامْ Every type of blood you shall not eat an everlasting statute. An everlasting statute. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّمَا حَرَّمَ عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَيْتَةَ وَالْدَّمَا وَالْأَحْمَ الْخِنْزِيرِ He has prohibited for you, prohibited for you, the flesh of dead animals that carry on. Uh, as it were, and blood and the flesh of pigs. So what we find here is we don't find theological consistency with Orthodox Christian uh, uh, Christology or theology. We find that the statements of Isa alayhi salam as recorded in the New Testament are perfectly in line with the statements of Musa alayhi salam, attributed to Musa alayhi salam in the Torah, which has a clear trajectory into the time, into the teaching and theology of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Rabbana zidna ilma. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to increase us in knowledge. Wassalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa Muhammadin wa alayhi wa sahbihi ajma'in. This is our final session uh, talking about the Holy Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Uh, I want to, in this session, look at a verse from the Quran, chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, ayah number 171. In which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins by saying, Ya ahl al kitab, la taghlu fi dinikum, wa la taqulu ala Allahi illa al haq. O people of the book. Now, Imam al Tabari, as, as well as Imam al Suyuti, they take ahl al kitab here to mean specifically ahl al injil, the people of the gospel, the Christians. Others, like Imam al Baydawi, he takes it as Jews and Christians. The verse continues. إِنَّمَا الْمَسِيحُ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ That Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was only the messenger of God. If we take the latter opinion, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing Jews and Christians, with respect to Jesus, do not mention, do not maintain that he was a false prophet or born out of wedlock. That, as is mentioned in the Talmud, which is the oral law that was finally regu regulated to writing and rabbinical exegesis upon it, this is considered ghulu. This is considered an extreme position with respect to Isa alayhi salam. But also, the other side of that, the other extreme, do not make him into a god or the literal son of God. This is also ghulu. This is also a type of excessiveness. Now the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, they tend to take synthetic or middle positions. So you have two extremes and the opinion of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah is in the middle way, what the Buddha would call uh, Madhyamika, the middle path, the middle way. For example, I'll give you an example, the issue of the grave sinner. The Khawarij said, someone who commits a major sin, a mortal sin, has apostated the religion. They're no longer Muslim. The uh, latter, Murji'a, they had the diametrically opposed opinion and said if someone uh, doesn't follow the Sharia, then it doesn't even affect their Iman. They were antinomians. The Sharia is optional. So Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'a, they said a major sin does affect your Iman. You're still a Muslim, however, but now you have to make Tawbah. Okay, if the former opinion of Imam at tabari Imam Suyuti, that Ahlul Kitab here means the people of the gospel. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is then telling us that the Christians, telling the Christians not to go into extremes about Isa alayhi salam. 
In the past, Christians have maintained that Isa was both human and divine. And some said he became divine at his birth. Others said he became divine at his uh, baptism. Others said he became divine at his resurrection. This latter is dubbed Exaltation Christology by Bart Ehrman in his new book, How Jesus Became God. And this seems to be Pauline Christology. Paul seems to say that Jesus became divine in some way at his resurrection. Other Christians say that he was always divine as the pre-eternal son, and that while he was caused by God, he was caused or generated by God, God caused him to be before time, so God does not have temporal uh, precedence over the son. Therefore, according to these Christians, there is no difference ontologically between the father and the son. Other Christians said that Jesus is two persons with two natures. Some Gnostics said that. Other Christians said he's one person with one nature. This is called modal monarchism or patripassianism. Other Christians said he's one person with two natures, and this represents Catholic or Protestant Eastern Orthodoxy. Others said that he's only divine. He's not human at all, like the docetists, which comes from the Greek verb dokeo, which means to seem or to appear, that Jesus only seemed to be flesh and blood. He was really a phantasm, a spiritual being. This was the opinion of the Marcionites and many other Gnostics. With respect to proto-Orthodox Christianity, the first four ecumenical councils reveals an interesting evolving Christology. In 325 of the Common Era, the first ecumenical council, the Council of Nicaea, presided over by Constantine, they voted, the bishops, 318 bishop, bishops voted, and they decided that Jesus is hamausias, that the Son is co-substantial with the Father. Not homoiousias, not similar to the Father, not heterousias, not different essentially than the Father, but of the same substance as the Father. This was in 325 of the Common Era. In 381, at the Council of Constantinople, the Holy Spirit was also declared officially to be co-substantial with the Father and the Son. The Council of Ephesus, we mentioned in the first session about Isa Mary was declared Theotokos, the carrier or bearer of God. And in the Council of Chalcedon in 451 of the Common Era, Jesus was declared to have two natures. He's 100% God and 100% man. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, إِنَّ مَنْ مَسِيحُ إِيسَ بْنُ مَرْيَمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ As we said, that Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, was only the messenger of God. And his word, and we said in previous sessions that this could mean either that he is his special personal creation or his unique pre-eternal impersonal decree that eventually manifested in space-time as Christ. Alqaha ila Maryam, that he cast upon Mary and a spirit from him. And here, according to the Mufassirin of the Qur'an, the exegetes, the meaning of this is that the teachings of Christ are very ruhani, they're very spiritual, they're very mystical in nature. He was an ascetic. In a hadith recorded by Imam Ahmad, uh, the disciples came to Isa and they said to him, how is it that you can walk on water? Isa said, bil yaqeen, with yaqeen, with certitude. And they said, we have certitude. And he said, bring to me three objects. Bring mud, stones, and gold. Mud, stones, and gold. So they brought these objects. And Isa salam said, what do you say about them? They said, stones are better than mud and gold is the best. He said, I don't see a difference between any of them. Know the secret of this and you can walk on water. You can transcend the elements. Islamic Christology sees itself as a restoration of the message and status of Christ. It is a restored theology of the Evionim, the original Christians, the Ebionites, the Notsrim, the Nazarenes that were marginalized into oblivion when Constantine declared Hamausias as the official version of Christianity. 
Our version, our Christology of Christ is that he was only human. Some have called this Semitic adoptionism, dynamic monarchism, but he was the messenger of God. He was the slave of God par excellence. He was the true Messiah, and he was a forerunner of Ahmad, also known as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. The ayah concludes, فَآمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ So believe in Allah and in his messenger. وَلَا تَقُولُوا ثَلَاثَةَ and don't say three, don't say trinity. Intahu, desist, khayran lakum, khayran lakum. Desist, it will be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahun wahid. For your God, for indeed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only one God. Subhanahu ayyakuna lahu walad. Glory be to him that he should have a son. Lahu, for him. This lamb here, it's called lamb tamlik, the lamb of ownership that he owns, that he possesses مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ Everything in the heavens and in the earth وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَكَفَى بِاللَّهِ وَكِيلًا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is sufficient as a protector. Now as I said earlier, and we'll end with this inshallah ta'ala, as I said earlier, nowhere in the New Testament does Isa alayhi salam ever say, I am God or worship me. A lot of Trinitarian Christians point to the I Am statements, the prologue of John's Gospel. We dealt with John 1.1. 1, 1. We looked at John 10.30. Also, John 8.58 is also claimed to be a divine claim of Isa salam by mainstream Christian, mainstream Christian exegetes. Because Isa salam, according to this passage, he says in the Greek, Prin Abraham genestai ego emmi. Before Abraham was, I am. And the claim here is that if you look at Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses is at the burning bush and he's speaking to God and he says, when I go into the Israelites, they're going to ask me your name. What shall I tell them? And God tells him, say to them, eh ye, ashar, eh ye, I am what I am. I am what I am. Interestingly, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he noticed in the Quranic version of the story, we also have this duplication of I am. When Musa alayhi salam is at the burning bush, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells him, idhab ila fir'aun. But before that, when Allah identifies himself, he says, inni an Allah. I am, I am Allah. Why? According to Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq and Abu al-Qasim al-Junaid, the meaning of that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling Musa alayhi salam that he is the only non-contingent being, the only necessary being, the only one that can truly say I am and mean it in its right. Well, everything else is, is, is contingent and derived from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Christian claim here is Jesus is saying before Abraham was I am. God told Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3, I am what I am. Jesus is claiming to be God. Interestingly, in 250 before the Common Era, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek, a very famous translation called the Septuagint, or the LXX, meaning 70. And when the Gospel authors, when they quote from the Old Testament, they're not translating directly from Hebrew, they're pulling from the Septuagint. And this is what the verse sounds like, Exodus 3.14, in the Septuagint. Ego emmi ho on. God tells Moses, I am ho on. Ho is a relative pronoun. On, present, active, participle. Meaning, I am the one who is. I am he who is. The one who never dies. The one who is eternal. In the Greek in John, Jesus simply says, ego emmi. He doesn't say ho on. He doesn't say the divine part. He simply says, I am. I am what? Well, if we go back to John chapter 4, we have the first I am statement. And this first I am statement is going to guide our meaning, right? Tafsir by the book, Tafsir of John by John. It'll guide the rest of the I am statements in meaning throughout the Gospel of John. So Jesus is at the well. The woman at the well says to him, I know the Messiah is coming, who shall tell us all things. Jesus responds in verse 26, Ego emmi ha lalon soy. I am he, the one who is speaking to you. I am what? God? No, I am the Messiah. When Jesus makes his I am statements all throughout John, they are claims of being the Christ, the Messiah, not claims of being God. 
But why say it like this? Before Abraham was, I am the Messiah. Why say it like that? Well, Jesus could be defending his legitimacy as the Messiah by appealing to his uh, pneumatic temporal precedence over Abraham. In other words, the creation of his soul predates that of Abraham. And this is how we uh, looked at the prologue, John 1, 1. So Isa alayhi salam is using, if this verse is authentic, he's using a very cogent, very strong argument, defending his legitimacy as the Messiah, that I was in the knowledge and will of God even before Abraham was created. But it's not a divine claim. Is it usual for prophets to speak like this? Well, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, when did you become a prophet? He said, when Adam was bayna ruh wal jasad. When Adam was between the spirit and the body, I am the seal of the prophets. Meaning that his ruh was already created because the ruh of a person is that person, essentially. So the Prophet ﷺ essentially could say, prin Adam ganastai. Ego emmi. Before Adam was, I am. But this is not a divine claim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala increase us in knowledge. I'm going to end this final session by quoting the motto of Zaytuna College, like I've done at the end of every other session. Rabbana uh, zidna ilma. We're going to recite it in the plural. Rabbana zidna ilma. Rabbana zidna ilma. O our Lord, increase us in knowledge. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your Ramadan and accept uh, all of our fasting and our prayers and our reading of the Quran and seeking knowledge for His sake alone. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.